Oh, the little known fact is that I was actually here 11 years ago substituting for my uncle, then George, uh, then President George W. Bush, and I was attending law school uh, in Austin at the time and shared some Bush family anecdotes. And since that time, a lot has really changed in my life, as was mentioned. I've, I've practiced law. I, I met a beautiful West Texan who I've, who I've married and, and now actually expecting my first child with uh, this summer. I've, uh, it's okay to applaud uh, having a child. I'd say it's overall not a bad thing. Um, since that time, I've started two businesses. I've practiced law, and I'm pursuing my dreams and seeking to serve you, um, ser serve the state of Texas. And I really think that it's only in great places like Texas that these kind of dreams can be achieved. And that's why I want to devote my, my professional life and my time to, to serving you in a, in a higher responsibility. I was asked to talk this afternoon about some of the critical challenges we face, not only in the U.S., but also here in Texas, in a non-confrontational and a non-partisan fashion. Um, that should be easy to do, right, in today's political environment. Um, but in all seriousness, I was asked to present some thoughts about, um, about the current session in, in Austin and, and maybe provide some, some helpful hints in terms of the path forward for our great state. And generally, and I fundamentally believe these are common sense proposals that many of us can, can latch on to. First, I wanted to applaud the, the session's current focus on education reform here in the great state of Texas. I look at education not like most aspiring uh, uh, politicians or elected officials. I've actually been in the trenches. I've taught in inner city uh, public high school. I've taught in a migrant farming community. In fact, I recall when I started the year with 150 students in the dropout prevention program, I lost 20 students halfway through the year. I lost half a dozen young women to teenage pregnancy. I lost uh, a young man for possession of narcotics in my classroom. Another young man was arrested in my classroom for attempting to steal a, a teacher's vehicle. And these are the types of conditions that many teachers face in the current environment here in Texas, and that's why I feel so passionate about it. I also look at education through the lens of my current participation as the chairman of the Fort Worth Board for Uplift Education, which is a public charter school network in North Texas. And I'm not embellishing statistics here and saying that 60% of our students qualify at the federal poverty rate of socioeconomic status. 80% of our students are minority, and yet 100% of our students graduate from high school and over 90% graduate from a four-year university. Some of the lessons that I've learned as a, a public high school teacher in the migrant farming community and also as, as a community activist working with the public charter school network, it, it's taught me a, a variety of lessons, and, and I think these are the lessons that legislators now are taking on in this session. First, we have a, a school year that's organized around the fundamental principle that for every year that passes, that a child should be promoted, regardless of whether or not that child has learned a subject. I think we need to completely eradicate the idea of the concept known as social promotion. I think that as a child enters middle school, they should have the fundamental ability to read and write before they absorb subject matter material. We need to raise standards so that a high school degree means exactly what it says it does, that you're ready to take on post-secondary levels of education. The fastest growing course right now in post-secondary education in Texas, it's remedial education. It's going back to the basics. We need to also emphasize, and it goes without saying, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in some of our higher performing school districts and some of our higher performing classes. I think there's so much talent here in North America and to have a policy for our employers to import our scientists and engineers from abroad, I, I think is, is a fool's errand. We, can, we have so much talent here in Texas, let's unlock that, that talent. And as a teacher, I think we need, to be, we need to be treated like the professionals that we are. We need to incentivize these professionals based on student performance, using a holistic approach, not solely based on standardized examination, but looking at the overall form of pedagogy that is needed to help students perform in, in today's schools. For those of you who may not know me, you know me 
Uh, for those who do know me in the crowd, you know me as somebody that loves studies. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation recently conducted um, a study of many school districts throughout the country, including DF, uh, DISD, Fort Worth ISD, Austin ISD, you name it, the big, the big school districts in our state. And among other things, what they found, the two criteria that matter least for student performance is, are the amount of degrees that a teacher has and the length of, of service that a, that a high school teacher has. Uh, but yet every single contract that we enter into with a public high school teacher in Texas solely leverages those two criteria. So we need to expand that, that viewpoint and look at various ways to incentivize the great work that our teachers do. Secondly, we need to bring regulation into the, uh, into the 21st century. I, I look at this issue as, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur here in Texas. I look at the assault of regulation and of taxation on small business owners um, in our great state. Notwithstanding these challenges, Texas is still the best state to do, to do business as evaluated objectively and, and, and subjectively. But in my opinion, regulations and taxation is stifling entrepreneurship, and it's killing small businesses. I think we need to, instead of looking at creating large, complex, and, and broad scope laws that are difficult to follow and difficult to comply with, that we measure compassion um, as it relates to healthcare, education, and, and all the important issues of our day by, by weighing, by a cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not these regulations and laws really do create jobs and create opportunity in our state. Being in the financial services industry, the best example that I can think of is, is Dodd-Frank. And for my top line revenue, close to 8% of my top line was spent just complying with the early stages of Dodd-Frank. When I was graduating from law school, there was a, a law called Sarbanes-Oxley that, uh, that was passed um, through Washington, D.C. And it was only 67 pages in length. Uh, Dodd-Frank, however, is over 2,300 pages in length. It creates dozens of rulemaking agencies and commissions, and it, it's taking several years to implement. Um, so we need to completely revamp and rethink the way that we draft our laws and, of course, conduct uh, sunset reviews to make sure that there actually is a benefit. Third, as Texans, what I've noticed in my, in my travel is that we respect at a higher level our, our veterans. We know that the men and women of our military deserve nothing less than the best from each and every one of us. As was mentioned, I'm, I'm a veteran of Operation Enduring Freedom and supported one of our, our nation's finest military units, the Special Operations Command. I learned a lot about myself while serving in the military and continue to wear the uniform. In fact, I uh, still conduct my weekend drills at, in your largest suburb, uh, San Antonio, um, at Lackland Air Force Base once a month and still, still wear the uniform. But it goes without saying that our military men and women put everything on the line, 24-7, 365, without any questions asked. And as veterans return back to, uh, to, to Texas, there will be 1.7 million veterans, it's estimated, when, when all troops draw down. We need to, as civilians, maintain our commitment to them. And so one area that I've written about as a candidate for public office and one that I've, that I've spoken about within the military community is post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD. Now, regretfully, there are policymakers both in Austin and Washington, D.C., that have recently been quoted as saying that this is a newfound phenomenon, that it was only started in Afghanistan and Iraq, and which is patently false. Uh, and what scares me is that a lot of legislators nowadays do not come from a military background and fully grasp this, this important issue. Little known fact to, to maybe many, many of these legislators is that the largest cause of death in the military now, it's not on the battlefield. It's suicide, and PTSD is one of the largest contributors to this, to this rate of suicide. So we as civilians clearly have a call to, to service, a service to, to members of our military to raise the red flag, look out for our battle buddies, and, and keep an eye out for the mental health of our soldiers, sailors, and airmen. A recent study also showed here in Texas that only one in three veterans here in the state are fully aware 
of the benefits and privileges available to them thank you, thanks to their service um, here in Texas. One of those benefits happens to be the Hazelwood Act, and I, I'm not sure if, if you all are familiar with that act, but it allows veterans to basically achieve the American dream by helping to finance their, their post-secondary education, either for themselves or for direct family members. And I think it's a shame that there are legislators that are considering scaling back this benefit. Um, I think we owe this commitment to our, to our military veterans here in the state of Texas, and I think that the legislature should work to stop this. The, uh, the General Land Office, not, not the Agriculture uh, Department, but the General Land Office does work with Veterans Affairs issues, and, and this is one of the areas that I feel absolutely passionate about, is raising the, the profile of these issues and making sure that veterans are aware of what's available. We owe them nothing less. And so with this moment, I wanted to take the opportunity to recognize any members, active duty members or reservists that are here with us today to please stand up. Now I'd, I'd like to recognize those that sacrifice just as much as those in the military, any relatives, direct relatives, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, or children of active duty or reservists. The state of Texas and the United States thanks you for your sacrifice. Finally, as Texans, we recognize, recognize the need of being so close to the energy uh, industry, the need for an a patriotic energy security policy. Great nations, in my opinion, cannot maintain a competitive posture in the world without having an independent supply of, of energy. So here's a, a little statistic to think about. In 1983, just 30 years ago, we imported 28% of our oil that we consumed within our borders. That figure right now is 60% in just 30 years. We, in the next 30 years, need to reverse that trend to be a net exporting country. And thanks to science and technology in the energy industry, we've already seen the Eagle Ford Shale provide that potential opportunity. Texas, as we know, is a rich resource of energy and currently leads the nation in oil production, both on our public and private lands. And if the country is, is going to service our $17 trillion debt and our roughly $1.3 trillion annual operating deficit, we need to leverage all of the forms of energy that are available to us here, not only in Texas, but throughout the country. Quick story that I wanted to share with you is it actually takes place on the south side of San Antonio. Two gentlemen, Ruben Garza and Cesar Sainz, two entrepreneurs that I met um, a few years back in the beginning of the Eagle Ford shale play. For a very long time, for over 20 years, they worked in the field, field service businesses, moving frac sand, frac water, and decided, like many entrepreneurs, to take their life savings and start their first business uh, a few years back. Like many entrepreneurs, they faced challenges. They, there was definitely bumps in the road, but now they service um, many different clients in, in an area of San Antonio where there's great economic growth. They employ over 40 workers, they give generously back to their community and generate millions of dollars for the south side of San Antonio. I think we need leaders in Washington, D.C. and in Austin that come from a business background and that recognize that it's not politicians that create opportunity. What politicians can do is create the conditions by which entrepreneurs and job creators can create opportunity in our country. In conclusion, I'm, I'm thrilled by the progress of the legislative session um, as it relates to, to term limits, as it relates to developing a comprehensive water infrastructure policy and conservation policy. But that shouldn't stop us from reforming our education system, protecting our veterans, curtailing regulation, and expanding upon the great resources that we have in the great state of Texas. As part of my formal announcement for land commissioner, I was quoted as saying that I'm constantly reminded that as Texans we are an exceptional people. And I truly believe that. I can't contain my burning optimism for being a Texan, for being born here, for being educated here, and having the opportunity to create opportunity here. 
I'm privileged to be with you this afternoon, and I look forward to continuing in my small way to help navigate our state in a more positive direction and keeping us the greatest state in the union. May God bless each and every one of you. May God bless the great state of Texas, and may God bless the United States of America.